guys. Steve from Rediscovering God. I'd like to continue on with the series about myself, uh, my story, the studies I myself went through, what verses of Scripture really convinced me, proved to me that you know, Christianity is a lie. Christianity completely goes against the truth of Judaism, of Tanakh. And um, before I get started, guys, uh, first things first, hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and big thumbs up if you like what I'm doing here. So last time I left off with that, that I would go over with the go over the you know really the first concrete discrepancy that just made it absolutely clear. Um, so a few seconds of background on that context. As I had talked about before, I was I was very much you know ensconced in study. You know, studying the Bible was, still is, but a passion of mine. And we really need to be honest with ourselves that if we are honest in our faith, then the texts, especially as a Christian, you know, because before, before I had begun to learn about Judaism, that's all you have is the texts, you know, it's sola scriptura. Um... So I held the text in such a high regard that, you know, it's really, and if you know anything about the Bible, it's really your only concrete evidence. You know, anyone can say they had a spiritual or miraculous experience, but according to Deuteronomy 13, such a thing really doesn't matter a whole lot. Regardless, so the text, that was my foundation. You know, the more I could know about the text, truly the more I could know about the mind of God. And that's that's how I approached my study, and that's why I held the text in such a high regard. Um, so even as a Christian, I understood that the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, were really on a plane of their own. You know, and maybe this is... Maybe looking back, this was planted by God to make my exodus from Christianity a little bit easier. But I think, really across the board, unless you're a Marcionite and just reject the Tanakh altogether, but I would, I would venture to say that even though most Christians don't know what it says, um, the five books of Moses really have their own place as far as I guess you could say the hierarchy of Scripture. You know, they're really, the Torah really just, really stands above all the rest. And maybe I'm wrong about that, but that was at least the way I looked at things, even as a Christian. Is the Torah really is in its own league. Um, so I was, I was listening to Tap Rabbi Tobias Singer, and... Uh, like I said, I had gone through his entire YouTube channel. I was watching video after video after video, so much so that my, my wife would, my wife would uh, beg me to skip the next video because she was so sick and tired of hearing his theme song. Um, but I was listening to it all the time, watching him all the time, just soaking in as much as I possibly could. I couldn't get enough. Uh, and then. It was almost as if he had said something I had never heard before. Which blew me away because of how much I really did study the Bible. It just goes to show that when you have the Christian lenses on, you really can just read right over something and not digest it. Um, and he stated, he quoted verse uh, 2319 in the book of Numbers. And, um, of course, I had heard the Bilam story before. I had heard about the angel with sword drawn standing in front of him, Hasatan, uh, the donkey talking, him hitting it three times. You know, every Christian, at least, is familiar with the story. But then to know what Bilam says, written in the Torah, 
It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And man, did this just absolutely stick with me. This, this one verse shattered everything in Christianity for me. Um, to me, it was irreconcilable as a Christian. I don't know if most Christians have that one verse that really does it for them, but to me, Numbers 23, 19 is so absolutely foundational as opposition to the entire Christian claim that I, it just could not be reconciled. And this might be my modalist mind. I was always very fond. And even as a Pentecostal, the Shema, Deuteronomy uh, 6.4, is actually like... A Pentecostal actually adheres very close to it because we're on the side of there's only one God, you know. I shouldn't say we, but at the time, we were on the side of only one God. You know, no trinity, completely rejected. So when I read this, the thing is, I knew I had read it before, but it just never, I never allowed it to, you know, I didn't allow it to grow, I didn't allow it to sink in. Um, so when I read this, the first thing, and honestly, Rabbi Tobias Singer didn't even go into that much detail about this verse. You know, this one, I, I actually felt my jaw hit the floor when he when he mentioned it. I just never had to, I never put the connection together until then. And the first thing my mind went to was Jesus' baptism. And it was like everything about Jesus' baptism just completely opposed this verse. And this being the Torah, anything that opposes it, anything that is antithetical to it, is wrong. Period. Even as a Christian, you must concede such a point. Anyway, let me just break down why to me it was so impactful that Jesus' baptism opposed Numbers 23-19 so, you know, so explicitly. So it says, God is not a man that he should lie. Okay? And if you want to, if you're going to be dropping a comment on this video and saying, well, God can do whatever he wants. We're not talking about what God can do. That's clear. God can do anything he wants. But what did he say he w will and won't do? That's, that's pivotal. That's central, foundational. What did he say he would do? What did he say he won't do? Now, if in the Torah, the first five books, it states... God is not a man that he should lie, period. It means he won't lie. It also means he's not a man. Well, as a modalist, or even as a Trinitarian, because they both believe that, you know, Jesus was 100% divine and 100% man. So by becoming a man, okay, because the argument is always, well, God just robed himself in flesh and dwelt among us, you know. Um, that makes him a liar. If God says one thing and then does the exact opposite, that makes him a liar. So God says in Numbers, I'm not a man. And then, you know, first century CE, he robes himself in flesh and becomes a God man. It's a lie. That made him a liar. So there at the outset, big red flag for me. And then it says, nor the son of man that he should repent. And this is where the baptism really hit me. Because the expression, son of man, appears 81 times in the Koine Greek New Testament. Uh, of, the four gospels, of the four Gospels, it appears 30 times in Matthew, 14 times in Mark, 25 times in Luke, and 12 times in John. That Jesus is referred to as the son of man. So, my uh, rational mind took this right back to Numbers 23, 19. God is not the Son of Man. And to me, it was just like, well, what, <laughs> why would he call himself that? Why would he make himself a liar? God, God won't lie. 
God doesn't lie. God is not a man, nor is he the son of man. And then, every Christian will concede that Jesus' baptism was by John the Baptist, and his baptism was for repentance. And, um, you know, the Christian refutation to what I'm about to say would be that Jesus got baptized as an example. Well, why would you need to get baptized as an example for repentance? Regardless, the baptism was for repentance, whether you believe it was for an example or not. Um, but nor is God the Son of Man that he should repent. So, in one, in one fail swoop at Jesus' baptism, God became a man, which made him a liar, because he said he will not be, he's not a man. Uh, and at his baptism, throughout the New Testament, he's called the Son of Man, which also, referring back to Numbers 23, 19, he is not, and he was baptized with the baptism of repentance. Again, makes him a liar. Those four foundational points are all, right out the gate, are all, you know, present in the New Testament. And it's completely, it's the antithesis to the Torah. God is not a man, yet Jesus was a man. Every Christian will say so, whether he was 100% divine or not. Okay? God does not lie. Um, when, <laughs> when Jesus is born, if he is God and he becomes a man, well, guess what? That just made God a liar. So, now you just broke the second part of the first clause nor the Son of Man. Jesus is referred to the Son of Man numerous times. Once again, breaks the third clause of Numbers 23, 19. He was baptized the baptism of repentance. He's not the Son of Man that he, that he must repent. It breaks all four of the first four clauses in Numbers 23, 19. And then it continues on and says, has he not said and shall he not do it? Basically, does he say something and not, does he go back on his promises? No, of course not. Um, which we can demonstrate that through Jesus said he'd be that the gener generation wouldn't die before he comes back. So he told them something, basically affirmed them a promise and didn't carry it out. So um, I don't really want to harp on this, but in conjuncture, the uh, the verse Psalm one forty six three says, "Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help." Some translations translated as in whom there is no salvation. So, in short, guys, this was really the first, the biggest discrepancy. You know, when, when I really sat down and thought about what Numbers 23, 19 was saying, weighed against the Christian claim, it all fell apart. This is the only verse I needed. Of course, <laughs> there is so much more I've studied that just adds on to this point, you know, everywhere. There's nothing in the New Testament that I would say is legitimately cohesive with Tanakh. Um, but Numbers 23.19 was really that... And like I had said in the last video, I was, I was noticing discrepancies beforehand. But when I really sat down and just chewed on this for... You know, I chewed on this for a while, and I couldn't reconcile it. And... If you can, <laughs> then that means you're simply just discrediting what the Torah says. Um, or you don't believe Jesus was divine. So, at one point or another, you're having to discredit, whether it be the Torah or the New Testament, something about your belief to reconcile this. Um, but for me, it was irreconcilable. And I think it really should be, for anyone who's honest in their seeking of truth and their their desire to have Hashem active in their lives, you know, if, if you really want the truth, you know, He will show it to you. But you have to be honest about it. You can't. There can't be any any um, any ulterior motive. And that's really what it was for me. And Jesus' baptism and his existence. Period. Um, Weight against 20, Numbers 23, 19, it's, it's just, it's a no-brainer. It's irreconcilable. 
But like I said before, guys, um, and I'll keep I'll keep going forward with more more uh, instances like this, more examples of the the verses of Scripture that really prove to me, you know, that the New Testament is it true that the Jesus claim is false and that it is antithetical to the Tanakh, the Torah especially. Um, but yeah, guys, next time, whether it be you know tomorrow, the day after, whenever, I'll be back on with the next one. Um, but until then, uh, Steve Eisenhower, find me on Facebook, drop a comment on the video. Email me, rediscoveringgod22 at gmail.com. Uh, if you have any questions, just want to pick my brain, you want to discuss what I talked about here today, all good. Um, but just, just keep in mind, guys, that you really have to, uh, you have to be going into this with an open mind. You know, you can't... I even still kind of had the Jesus glasses on when I, when I read this. You know, but I think really the most important thing is the sincerity. You know, if you're honest, you're sincere, and you, you regard the text above anything. So here is the deal, and I'll close with this. You know, as a Christian, it was like, you know, I love Jesus, you know, Jesus this, Jesus that. Of course, I had my, my strong feelings of love for Jesus. That's like it's foundational for a Christian, obviously. But I love the text more. You know, I could pray to Jesus all I wanted. Could or, you know, may or may not have gotten an answer, whatever. But what I did have right in front of me was a whole book of the Word of God that I didn't need to wait for an answer for. And the deeper I studied into it, you know, you want to talk about the mind of God and divine revelation and, you know, getting a word? Well, he gave you <laughs> a whole book full, you know? Why rely on something else? Something that is unverifiable. The, the words in the book are verifiable. And I just held the text in such a high regard that my personal feelings, I wouldn't allow them to get in the way. You know, like I said, when, it first, when I was first leaving, I was broken cried, I felt lied to for my entire life, you know, and it's a really tough place to be, really, it really is not easy, but when you hold the text in such a high regard, and you understand that the words in front of you are heaven breathed, you know, I think when you get to that level of sincerity and respect for the word of God is when you know, the understanding will actually be a bit more available. Um, yeah, so that's it, guys. Um, like I said, thanks for the watch. Drop a comment. Uh, but until next time, this is Rediscovering God, and I'll see you on the other side.